Well, good morning. We want to welcome you to the service of South Swansea Baptist Church this morning. Would you stand with me, please, and join with me as we sing our opening song this morning, Holy, 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 direct your attention to the screen. Wow, a lot of people here. I was sitting there facing the front. I turned around and it's quite full. Good morning. How's everybody doing? What's that? All to oh, no, I don't. I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. A lot of pressure. I have decided. To follow Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning. Follow. No, no one 
joins me, still I will follow. Though no one joins me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Decide now to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back, no turning back, no turning back. No turning back. Amen. What's that? Oh. If you're happy, notify your face. <laughs> Make sure your face knows and you get that big smile on. <laughs> no matter, look, <clears throat> no matter how bad the world gets, no matter how, how bad and desperate the world gets, keep smiling because we know where we're going. If you're happy, notify your face. Take that frown off and put a smile in its place. You love Jesus, then show it to the human race. If you're happy, notify your face. I go to many meetings, see Christians everywhere. We sing and talk of Jesus and how it'll be up there. We talk of all the burdens confronting the human race And say our Jesus is the answer with a frown all over our face If you're happy, notify your face Take that frown off and put a smile in its place You love Jesus, then show it to the human race If you're happy, notify your face we claim we got the answer to everything that's wrong Then sit in church impatiently when services get long Then we go out into the world with faces sad and mean No wonder folks won't listen that Jesus is supreme If you're happy, notify your faith Take that frown off and put a smile in this place you love Jesus, then show it to the human race. If you're happy, notify your face. People stop and watch us, they don't know what to do. We tell them Jesus is the answer and that he loves them too. We don't always look happy and that confuses them. Well, if Jesus is the answer, Let's all say a loud amen. If you're happy, notify your face. Take that sound off and put a smile in its place. If you love Jesus, then show it to the human race. If you're happy, notify your face. 
If you're happy, notify your face. Amen. <laughs> Good morning, South Swansea. Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Awesome. Uh, following our service this morning, we have our uh, FBT class uh, at 945. We have the men up here, as well as the ladies downstairs. Uh, we've had a good group, especially for the men lately. So uh, keep coming out, guys. It's been, uh, it's been a blessing. Uh, also, we have uh, our American Sign Language class um, this Monday at 915, and that'll be next door. Also, Wednesday nights, we have our Bible study and prayer, like we usually do, at 7 o'clock as well. And that the pastor's still going to a study, uh, so um, please join us, you know, and uh, we dig into the Word a little more. Also, we have a guest speaker today. Um, some of you may know him. I didn't personally know him, but I got to know him on Wednesday and yesterday at Grace and Granite. Uh, it's, uh, he's the pastor of uh, Rock Point Church in Crawfordsville, Indiana, and his name's uh, Jeff Hohenschel. I know many of you know the family. Uh, he's the, uh, her, his wife is Carissa Sargent, so the name sounds familiar. You guys know who, who the relation there, so that's the pastor's daughter. And they have their four uh, children with, him, uh, with them today. It's Jolie, Judah, JC, and Javen. So I got it right, all right? Uh, so just, um, I'm, we're looking forward to listening to them, and I'm looking forward to listening to um, Jeff in particular. So we got to talk a little bit uh, this past week, so uh, it'll be a blessing. Also, uh, before you leave today, we have our daily bread devotionals. They'll be in the back as you're walking out, um, greeting the pastor or even Pastor Jeff himself uh, in the back there. So please grab them as you're walking out and um, take one for a friend, uh, someone you can, that needs uh, the Lord, that needs sometimes, even if they don't come to church, and sometimes just one little devotional will get them into scripture, you know, and uh, open their hearts to God. So uh, please grab them as you leave. Also, just, um, you know, if you really think about it, we're already halfway through 2023, and uh, more than halfway, actually. Uh, today's the 25th. So uh, we have a meeting coming up for Vacation Bible School. Uh, obviously, we're two months away, a little less than two months away. So this uh, coming Wednesday, I'm sorry, um, my, my bad, July 12th on a Wednesday, there's going to be a prep and practice, and the meeting's at 6. So for Vacation Bible School, so my apologies there. Also, just to mark your calendars, speaking of Vacation Bible School, uh, it's also going to be on August 7th through the 11th at 9 a.m. to noon, and uh, the theme is Keepers of the Kingdom. And also in your bulletin, if you just take a quick peek, we also have our, um, our picnic, the church picnic, on July 15th at 10 a.m., and that'll be at Colt State Park in Bristol, Rhode Island. All right, with that, uh, the Galileans will sing one more song, and I'll uh, pray for the offering. 
Dear Lord, we just uh, thank you this morning. We thank you for um, the Hohenschel family, Lord, that have joined us uh, this morning. Um, we pray for a blessing from Pastor Jeff as he brings the word. We pray for our offering as well, Lord, that you just bless it. Bless our hearts, Lord, as we give to you. Uh, wherever it may go, Lord, wherever you've spoken to us this morning to, to give, Lord, that you just bless it and multiply it, Lord, in a mighty way. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Now, Tom, when we first started our group, how many people did we have? Yeah, we had 10 to 12. Then we went down to 5. Then we went down to 4. <clears throat> now we're down to 2. So I want to see who's going to be the last man standing. <laughs> So you're either going to hear me sing a cappella, or you're going to hear just music. So. <clears throat> Hopefully not too soon. I call your name. I find comfort just to know that you care. I walk each day a path that's peaceful, and every step I take, you're there. What a blessing just to know. I want to rise each day That you are guiding me In your gentle handed way And as I go about my day To lay my head to rest Just to know you love me, Lord I am blessed Just to know you love me, Lord I am blessed You made the stars to shine with wonder and the sky so blue majesty you gave the rain the mighty thunder and yet you still look down on me what a blessing just to know when I rise each day that you are guiding me in your gentle handed way and as I go about my day to lay my head to rest just to know you love me Lord I am blessed just to know you love me Lord I am blessed with every step I take, you're there. Call your name and I find rest. Just to know you love me, Lord, I am blessed. Just to know you love me, Lord, I am blessed. Tom, I hope you guys get to play and sing for a whole lot many years if the Lord tarries. But truly, truly, I would love to see the Lord come while the service is going on. Amen? Amen? And uh, we could all go to glory together. Listen, just before Jeff comes and speaks to us, I just want to draw your attention again to uh, some of the prayer requests that we have. I mentioned these folks. Please remember to keep them in your prayer. Jerry Bouchard, who's in the Kimwell Nursing Home, that's listed in your bulletin. 
And then also remember Roger Buat. Uh, Roger's going through some health issues. He was diagnosed with a pancreatic cancer, and they're formulating a plan for him. Uh, Peter LaCroix, we had pray, been praying for him. He had his surgery, and he's healing. Uh, Stell mentioned this morning he is making some good improvements, but still needs our prayers. But uh, he's come a long way. We thank the Lord for that. And then also, I spoke with Janine yesterday. John Tippins uh, had to go back into the hospital. Um, he's got uh, the oxygen in his blood is low. He's experienced nausea, some headaches. And so they're hopeful. He was in for a few days, hopeful that maybe he'll get to come home today. Not sure yet, but do continue to be in prayer for John. And then uh, Jerry Bedencourt, who uh, visits us. Jerry had been a part of our church for years, and her health prohibits her often coming out. Uh, she is now in Miriam Hospital. Uh, she had uh, some of the seizures affect her again, and so that's where she's at. Continue to pray for Jerry. And then, as always, do remember our church missionaries. Grab a letter, read some information about them to help you pray more effectively for them. And we thank God for the opportunity we have to pray, as well as to give in financial support. So let's take a moment and pray for these, and then we're going to turn it right over to Jeff, and he'll come up and speak to us. Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus, and we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here this morning in the house of the Lord with God's people, the opportunities we have to sing and to read scripture together um, and to give back to you a portion of what you've entrusted to us. And Father, we are so appreciative of all the good things that you do for us in our lives, the way you meet our needs, you take care of us, and you watch over us. And we lift up these this morning who need that care and watch care uh, for their health, um, for the various things that are going on for hospitalizations, uh, surgeries that have taken place, and now there's healing, and for some, the surgeries that will take place. God, we ask and pray that as our uh, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals, as our great divine physician, that you would work on behalf of each of the names of these people that we lifted this morning, that you would strengthen them, that you would remind them of your love and care for them, and that they would look to you in all things. We Pray for our missionaries this morning, God, that as we meet here, uh, as other Bible-preaching churches meet in this country and around the world, we remember that we serve you, and we are all part of your family in Christ, and the opportunities we have to live for you and to pray for one another as we seek to be a witness in the world that so desperately needs you. Help us to never lose sight of the importance of calling each other out in prayer and especially those on the foreign field and the work that you've called them to do. So bless us. Be with uh, Brother Jeff this morning as he comes and as he speaks to us today. Fill him with Holy Spirit power. Father, the word that you've given to him to share with us, may our hearts be open, may our minds be ready to receive what you have for us. Do an everlasting upon everlasting work in us, and we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jeff, you come here. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Man, it is good to be here. I am, uh, have been looking forward to this for weeks when uh, uh, my father-in-law called and asked if I'd be willing to come and preach to you. And I just got to say, it is a really special thing because it was uh, 16 years ago that I got married in this church on a beautiful Sunday or a Saturday night in December, and I married way, way up, and uh, <laughs> I stole pastor's daughter, and uh, Carissa has been such a blessing to me. She is so wise and discerning and courageous and faithful and funny. She just kind of makes my life fun, and uh, I really just enjoy doing life and ministry with her, and as you heard, we have Four beautiful kids, and you said all their names uh, right, Len. That was great. Uh, Jolie, Judah, JC, and Javen. We got, we got going with the J thing, and it just kind of stuck. Uh, and, and there's no test. Like, you don't need to know all their names. In fact, I probably 
mix them up a lot myself, <laughs> but they know that if I'm starting to say a J name and looking at them, I'm trying to get their attention. That's the way that works. But uh, I think uh, my oldest, Jolie, she is uh, helping out uh, this morning. I think she's helping grandma in junior church there, but Jolie is 15 this week. She turns 15 in three days and going to be a sophomore in high school, and she's driving this year, which is hard for me to believe. I know. I've got no hair, so of course I have a girl in you know, high school. But uh, then my oldest son, Judah, is going to be an eighth grader, and he is my creative thinker and a gifted musician, and he is super proud of the fact that he knows way more about Star Wars than I do. Um, He'd love to talk with you about that afterwards. Then my youngest daughter, JC, uh, she is going to be a fifth grader. And, and JC is, uh, she's my quiet comedian. She's kind of got a, a movie line for every occasion, but you kind of got to lean in to just make sure that you're hearing her. You don't want to miss it. And uh, she's just hilarious, but she's got a, a sparkle in her eye and leaves a sparkle everywhere she goes. And then there's Javen. Those of you who know Javen know what I'm talking about. He is, uh, I call him my uh, walking sermon illustration. Um, God gave Javen to us to keep us humble and entertained. And he does both of those really well. And he is a lot of fun. I would wish him upon anyone. Uh, so I am super thankful for my kids and really thankful that all of my kids show evidence that they really do love Jesus, which is really special. And uh, we love to serve the Lord together and are thankful that we get to do that in Crawfordsville, Indiana. Uh, we've been back in Indiana after having been in Washington, D.C. area for a number of years. We're back in the cornfields. We've been back for two years, and I'm the lead pastor there at Rock Point Church. And our mission is just to follow Jesus, love one another, and make disciple makers. And we believe if we do that, we're going to be a healthy church. We've got a vision of, of being a healthy church that's multiplying more healthy churches, uh, which is actually why I'm really thankful for you. I'm thankful that you are a healthy church that is staying faithful to the word of God. And we have some sweet memories of coming back to South Swansea Baptist Church over the years, and I'm really thankful for your friendship, your love, and your partnership in the gospel. It was a sweet thing yesterday to see the men gathering to get their Bibles open and, and enjoy some um, uh, malasada. Am I, saying it? Am I saying it right? Am I saying it right? Is it good enough, Lenny? That was, that was amazing. Now the secret's out. All the guys are going to show up for that. <laughs> but it was really cool to see the men gathering together. I love the fact that it is not uh, weird or unusual for you to hear these amazing words every single Sunday. Let's open our Bibles. Let's open our Bibles. Grab your Bibles and go with me to Psalm 119. Those are the best words you're going to hear all week, right? Let's open our Bibles, and we need more churches that are committed to that. So we're going to be looking at Psalm 119. And those of you who have spent a little bit of time in Psalm 119, you know this is the longest chapter in the Bible. So before you get nervous, I promise I'm going to let you out before lunch, okay? We're actually only going to look at two verses here. But this Psalm just revels in the treasure of God's word. And I want to take time to consider uh, the book that you're holding in your hands right now. And, and what a special thing is. I want, I want to encourage you to stay committed to the word of God as a church, but I also want to encourage you personally. Listen, I, I, know, I know you read your Bible, but I want to convince you again why you need this book, why it is so worth it, and let the author of his word just invite you into a deeper enjoyment of your relationship with him and just remind you, honestly, uh, you better be careful when you open up these pages. The contents are highly flammable, okay? God's going to use this book to change your life. Uh, a few years ago, the American Bible Society highlighted two significant studies that were conducted to try to help identify the number one predictor of spiritual growth. 
There was a study, uh, a year-long study of 2,500 people in 2008 by Lifeway Research. And then there was the Reveal survey that pulled 1,500 churches representing 400,000 people over four years. So, like, significant study. And they're looking for what helps people grow. What was significant was that both of these surveys found the same result. The number one way to help people grow in Christ. Anybody want to take a guess? Survey says? It's your Bible. It's daily Bible reading. The, the distinction between those who grow and those who don't is reading our Bible. Now, I found that to be true in my own life and in lives of guys that I've discipled over the years. But the most effective way for you to grow in your relationship with Jesus is to read his word, get into the word of God, and to make that a habit. that You're doing that every single day. Like, I know you're, you're there in Psalm 119, but I just, just think about the way the book of Psalms opens. Psalm 1, right? It tells us that blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. You see that, that downward progression. But, but it doesn't just start with somebody sitting and, and scoffing and laughing at the things of God. It actually starts by just walking along, listening to the counsel of the world and what the world has to say. And it is a slippery slope and a, a downward spiral when the primary source of information into my eyes, into my ears, is the things of the world. What I'm saying is like we get so much of the world, we need more of the word. It's kind of a crazy thought. Um, as a pastor, this may not be super encouraging, but think about, think about this. If you go to church every single Sunday, I'm talking like you never miss a Sunday. You're here every week, 52 weeks out of the year. You will hear in, in one year, you'll probably hear about 30 to 35 hours of preaching, depending on how long the preacher goes. <laughs> 30 to 35 hours. That sounds like a lot. But how long would it take you to consume 30 to 35 hours of media like watching tv uh, checking out the news scrolling on your phone uh, man a couple days maybe right and 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 listen you, what i'm saying is you don't you don't need more news or sports or social media or netflix or disney those things are fine to enjoy like we're thankful for those things but we need to be regularly putting god's word into our minds and more than just on sundays like, I hope you weren't having a hard time this morning finding your Bible because you couldn't remember where you set it down last week after church, like you haven't touched it since then, right? We, we, we love God's Word, and it is powerful, and it does not return void, but we need it more than just on Sundays. Someone says, blessed is the man who... His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates, do you know it? Day and night. Day and night. Like if you want to grow, you've got to learn to love God's word and chew and think and just meditate on it day and night. We need God's word. But here's what I'm going to show you in Psalm 119 this morning. Not only do we need God's word, but we need God's help understanding God's word. Some of you feel that. What do, what do you do when you're struggling to understand what you're reading? You ever been there? Like, man, I'm just, like, this is going over my head. Like, I'm not getting this, or I'm not sure what I'm supposed to take away from this. And, 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 and you know, honestly, maybe you start those, those uh, uh, Bible in a year plans. Many, many a Bible reading plans have been shipwrecked on the rocks of Leviticus. <laughs> Man, there's a lot of bloody sacrifices in there. Or, or you're, you're like feeling in the morning like, I just, I need some encouragement today. And then you open up your Bible and you read something like, you shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. <laughs> I'm not sure what to do with that. Or, or, or you're kind of wondering, sometimes you're reading and, and like, why do, I, why do I need to know the measurements of the tabernacle? That it's like 100 cubits and there's 50 loops in the curtains. Or, or, or then you read some like risque or brutal story. It's like borderline PG-13. You're like, that's in the Bible? Or, or, or you read something really deep in the New Testament. You're like, oh, that, that was so good. 
no idea what that means, right? Like, you're, you're been there. And I, listen, I'm not trying to dis- disrespect God's word. This, this, these are the words of life. But what I'm asking is, like, what do you do when you're just struggling to get it? Like, I, I don't understand what I'm reading. What do you do? Well, the answer is, you pray. Look at Psalm 119. Look at verse 18. Psalm 119, verse 18. Here's what we do. We pray when we read the Bible. Verse 18 says this. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Notice what the psalmist is doing. He's praying. He's he's asking God to help him see what's in his word so that he can understand it. That's, That's the big idea that I'd love for you to take away this morning. It's this. I need God's help to understand and obey God's word. I need God's help to understand and obey God's word. I need to acknowledge my need to him in prayer. So, so, so let me just ask you, do, do you pray before or even during and after reading your Bible? Do you pray during that time? Like a few years ago, this kind of struck me as like, I know this sounds so simple and basic, but This can be life transforming. Uh, Daniel Henderson, a pastor, Daniel Henderson, said it this way. Prayerlessness. So so when we don't pray, prayerlessness is our declaration of independence from God. Yikes. What he's saying is like, if, if I'm not praying and asking God to help me understand and obey his word, it must mean I don't think I need his help. Like, I'm good. I can handle this on my own. It reminds me when my kids were toddlers, okay, like two, three, and, and they want to uh, dress themselves. <laughs> Some of you either have kids or grandkids, you have experienced that there's, this is, it's actually an important parenting moment when your three-year-old comes out dressed in like a clown ensemble, right? Like a polka dot pants and, and some like clashing jammy shirt and their mismatched socks. And there's that moment where you're like, do, do I, ah, do I, what do I do here? Do I, do I tell them to go back and change? Or, and then you're just like, nah, we're going to Walmart. It doesn't matter, right? Like we're just let, let them go, right? You want your kids to be independent, but sometimes their independence is a little embarrassing. Or, or let me, um, let me pick on myself a little bit here. Um, I'm going to admit to you my own uh, foolish independence. Can I, can I tell you a story? Um, So, so when we moved back to Indiana, I had to uh, buy a riding lawnmower. Now, I'd never used a riding lawnmower before because I'd never needed a riding lawnmower. Uh, but I started learning how to use this thing. But, well, then last year, um, I needed to change the oil in this lawnmower and get it ready uh, for the season. Now, um, you don't know this. My kids and my wife know this. Uh, but you should know, I am not uh, mechanically inclined in the slightest. Uh, in fact, I shouldn't admit this. I, John's sitting right here. This is kind of embarrassing for me to have to say this in front of you. Uh, but the tools in my house are pink. Okay? <laughs> I have no manly skills. Uh, right? I have no business trying to change the oil in my mower. But I watched a couple of YouTube videos. And so then in my, and I got in my, I'm like, I got this. Like, I, I, I can handle it. I can do this on my, like, I, I got this. Well, it turns out I didn't got this. Like, I tried to, I I changed the the oil. I I, I thought I did. I thought I got it all done. Like, I I went out, and I was able to mow. I got it started. I mowed the, the, and then I put it in the shed. And about 20 minutes later, I'm out in the front, and I'm, like, weed whacking or something. And my neighbor pulls up driving in his truck, and he jumps out, and he screams, Your barn's on fire! And sure enough, I run around the corner, and my mower is just this ball of flame here. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. So, so, so then I have to run, and I grab the hose. was actually still in the shed. So I run in there, grab the hose, and I'm like hooking it up. And so uh, so uh, Carissa was actually not here at the time, thankfully. Problem was, when she showed up, the entire fire department had arrived at my house. And somehow, I actually got the fire out with my garden hose. The the firemen were actually so impressed, they offered me a job uh, that day. I turned them down, and I also retired 
that day from trying to change the oil in my mower. So this year, I wisened up a little bit, and uh, when it was time to get the mower ready, I asked for help. Because sometimes, independence can get us into trouble. So, so when we operate independently from God when we're reading our Bible, when we get up and we just start reading, we're like, I got this. So we can handle this. And we, we just jump right into it without spending time praying. It's silly at best. It can actually be really dangerous. Because we may not understand there's false teaching. What I'm saying is we need the Lord. So, so I'm just going to, here's, here's the application. I'm going to give you two prayer requests this morning for when you're reading your Bible. Here's the first one. Say this, Lord, help me understand your word. Lord, help me understand your word. Look at, look at verse 18. Again, look at the text. Look, look at verse 18. Look at what he says. He says, open my, what? My eyes. My eyes. You ever notice it's kind of hard to read with your eyes closed? Yeah. You, ever, you ever tried that? If we were to do a science experiment this morning, like, go ahead. Just close your eyes and try to read the rest of verse 18 right now. Just go, close your eyes. Try to, try to read verse 18. You're like, open my eyes. Like, it's impossible, right? You're realizing, like, with, with, you need your eyes to be able to see and read intelligible words. Like, try to imagine somebody hands you a book and then they blindfold you. Right? Like, unless it's an audio book. And, you're, like, that's not going to be a very effective reading strategy. Now, obviously, he's not talking about your physical eyes here, but he's talking about the eyes of your heart and your mind, your understanding. But the point is there. There are some awesome wonders in God's word. But until he opens our eyes, we can't see him. It's like we still have a blindfold on. We can't understand God's word without God's help. Do you know that? Think about this. Before you put your faith and trust in Jesus to save you from your sins, before you did that, you were spiritually blind. Do you know that? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says this. No one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit to open your eyes to see and believe the gospel. John chapter 3, think about this one. John the Baptist actually said this. A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. How, how many things can you have that you have not received? He's saying not even one. Not even one. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says the natural person, that's someone who hasn't accepted Christ yet, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Now, that doesn't mean that um, those who have never trusted in Christ can't have a reasonable grasp of the plot lines and the arguments in the Bible because somehow they're intellectually stupid. That's not what this is saying. But it does mean that on their own, they're going to miss the message, what God is actually saying. It's only those who are in Christ, who have been given the spirit, who can understand. These are spiritually discerned. We can't understand God's word without God's help. In fact, one theologian said it this way. He who ascribes to himself more understanding than this is the blinder for not acknowledging his blindness. That's what you're doing. We, we, we pray when we read the Bible. We're just acknowledging. We're admitting, Lord, without you, I'm blind. Like, I can't see this. I need your help. Lord, help me understand your word. This is what we call the doctrine of illumination. Illumination is when God opens our eyes to see the light. I want, I want you to think about this. This is what happened when Jesus met with his disciples after the resurrection. Okay, so he went to the cross. He's already been raised from the dead. And then at the end of Luke, in Luke chapter 24, he meets with his disciples and the text says that he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. That, that was a sweet light bulb moment where all of the disciples, all of a sudden, Jesus opened their minds. They're like, oh, I, I get it. And he had made kind of a, kind of a what, what sounds to us like a strange promise because Jesus told him, like, listen, guys, I'm, I'm getting ready to leave. 
which I know that's sad, but it's actually a good thing if I go away. Because if I go away, I'm going to send, he said, I'm going to send the helper, the Holy Spirit, and he will teach you all things. He will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. The advantage is now we have the Holy Spirit. One theologian actually defined the doctrine of illumination like this. He said it's the Holy Spirit's enabling of Christians generally to understand, to recall to mind, and to apply the scriptures that they've studied. The Spirit helps you understand it, helps you remember it, and helps you apply it. He is the great teacher he's the one the spirit is the one who takes the blindfold off so we can see the light let me tell you just like practically here's here's a couple of ways that he does that one of the ways that the spirit teaches you is through your pastor it's through your leaders you've been gifted to the church to help build up the body with a responsibility to preach the word and to guard the doctrine and i'm so thankful for my father-in-law doing that faithfully here how many 30 35 years been a while been a long time thankful for his willingness to do that and you need him but let's be real pastors we're just human okay and and, and so first corinthians 2 actually warns teachers we're, we're to rely on the spirit not on our own wisdom or our own speaking abilities you don't need a message from a man you need a message from the lord we need the word of God. And so the goal when pastors get up here is not to wow you, not to impress you, but, but, but you would see the awe of, of the glory of Jesus and God is glorified in the proclamation of his word, which is why we teach only what the word says. I, I tell our church every, hey, listen, it is never just another Sunday when we gather together as God's people. God's going to do something amazing when we open up. The word of God, do we see the glory of Christ on display there? So he's going to teach you through, his pastor, through, through your pastor, but the Spirit also teaches you his word through your own personal study. Psalm 1. On his law, he meditates day and night. But I'm praying, I'm asking, is there, every time I open, Lord, help me understand this. Help, help me remember this when I really need it, because I'm going to have those days where I really need that. And help me apply, help me to live this out. Look, look, at, look at what he says, verse 18. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. What are, what are the wondrous things? What are the wondrous things that we see? I love this. Listen, Here, here's what happens. When he opens your eyes, you are going to see and behold the wonder of the gospel. That this is all about Jesus. That we never move past the gospel. And this book is all about Christ. That's actually what happened. What, what, what Jesus showed his disciples in that light bulb moment at the end of Luke chapter 24. Jesus told them this. Everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Like the whole Old Testament. He said it must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. What he was showing them. The whole Bible points to Christ. Listen, listen. You have to understand the way the Bible. I know the Bible is not like arranged categorically, thematically. It is, it is not just a moral guidebook. Do you get that? Like, yes, there are commands. Yes, there's wisdom. Yes, God's way is always best, and, and we want to obey. But, but there's narrative, and there's poetry, and there's prophecy, and there's letters. And, 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 and honestly, so much of Scripture is actually revealing to us the nature of our sin and what our sin has done to the world. Like I've been reading lately, personally, I've been reading in... Uh, the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy. Do you know how many times you're reading these stories of the children of Israel? Like, man, these jokers, like, they just don't get it, right? And like, as much as I just like to shake my head, it, it's really like looking in a mirror. What, what we see is like, man, this is a picture of my heart and, and how my sin, my foolishness just a, makes a mess of our lives, right? Like, and what it does is it points us to our need for a Savior. 
And so when you're reading the Bible, whenever you find yourself, whenever you open up the pages of Scripture, you have to keep the whole narrative in mind. It is one big story telling us of God's great rescue mission by sending his son Jesus to save us from our sin and to bring reconciliation, to bring restoration. He's going to set all things right. And we're seeing the glory of Christ. We're seeing his character on display. We see his, his love and his justice and his, his grace to us in Christ. And I'm learning not to trust in what I've done, but to trust in what he has done for me. The Bible is so rich. Every day is just a part of a lifelong journey of learning and discovering the inexhaustible depths and beauty of his word because this book is meant to be read again and again and it always brings us back to a deeper understanding of the gospel and we see the glory of Jesus. It's like going on a treasure hunt. Or, or um, you, ever, you ever look at one of those Where's Waldo books? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Kind of like that. We open up, no matter where we're at in the scriptures, we, we open up the pages and we're like, there he is. We, we, we see Jesus. There he is. It all points to him. And so if you're wrestling with that and you find yourself kind of struggling and you want to see him, you need to approach our time in God's word with a humble dependence on the Holy Spirit to illuminate our minds. We're just praying, Lord, help me understand your word. But that's the first prayer request. Here's, here's the second prayer request, okay? Lord, help me understand your word. But the second is this. Lord, help me obey your word. Help me obey your word. Flip over to verse 34. Look at, look at verse 34. I'm trying to draw out some of the highlights from Psalm 119 here and the essence of what he's saying here. But verse 34, he says this. Give me understanding and or so that I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. He's saying, Lord, I want to do what your word says. Once, once we get it, once we grasp it and we can understand the gospel, that fuels our obedience because then we see how glorious he is. We realize he is our creator. He is our Lord. He's our master. He is the one who deserves our allegiance and our submission. I'm like, Lord, I want to do that. I want to submit to you. The expectation, James 1.22, is that we would be doers of the word, not just hearers only. And then James chapter 2, he goes on to try to clarify that this is the outworking of the gospel. Listen, we're not saved by our works. But we do have a faith that does work. We demonstrate that we really do love Jesus, that we believe in him and we belong to Christ by our obedience and our submission to him as Lord. And, and, and what he does is we open up the pages of scripture. He gives us a new desire to love him and to be holy as he is holy. Reading the Bible, I hope you know this. Reading the Bible is not just to make you smarter. It's to make you holier. This is not just an intellectual exercise. It's an act of worship. I'm listening, I'm seeing him, I'm, I'm growing in my love for the Lord, I'm in, in awe of him, and I want to respond in obedience to him. Look, look at what he says, I, I want to keep this with my whole heart, like everything in me. I want to follow in obedience to you, Lord. Not long ago, I learned about um, two friends in ministry that I had who had fallen into sin. Man, it's like hate seeing the devastation that that causes on their families. These are, these are guys who knew God's word, but they were just failing to obey it. Like, they knew it. And when I see and hear those stories, I'm like, Lord, help me. God, help me. I've experienced trusted leaders failing before, and it is painful, and it is deeply personal. And, and honestly, it makes me think about my kids and the influence that I have on them. And one of the things that I'm often praying, I pray this consistently, Lord, I, I want to earn 
sustained positive influence in my kids' lives. I don't want them to be turned off to the things of the Lord because they've just seen hypocrisy in me or lose the opportunity to keep pointing them to Jesus because honestly, they've just seen so much foolishness out of me, they just don't even want to listen anymore. I, I want to build a, a legacy of faithfulness. They, they would see, I'm not perfect, but I keep running back to Christ and there's an obvious love for Jesus in my life. And I, I know you want that too. Do you want to make an impact on your family that'll last? Obey God's word. Obey God's word. But what we, what we said is like, we can't even understand God's word without God's help. And we certainly can't obey God's word without his help. And so we pray and we're asking. And here's the cool part. He actually tells us that his spirit is at work in us. Philippians chapter 2 says we work out our salvation. We work out, but it is God who works in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So anytime I'm working out and you're seeing like evidence that I'm changing, that I'm growing, that's his work. He's done that in and through me. Praise God for that. As I learn to be led by the spirit and walk by the spirit, then all of a sudden the spirit produces spiritual fruit and it's coming out of my life. And let me tell you, here's, here's when that happens. That happens. This is so key. That happens not just when you read a list of rules. That happens when you see Jesus in Scripture. You might want to write this reference down. I love this verse. I go back to it a lot. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians 3, 18 says this. We all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. We're saying like incrementally, over time, we are being changed. What is changing us? It's, it's when our eyes are open, unveiled face, the blindfold is off, we can see. It's when we behold the glory of the Lord. We do that when we see Jesus in the pages of Scripture. That's what changes us. Saying, Lord, help me, help me see Christ here today. That's what will bring life change to you. Someone said it this way. The Spirit of God uses the Word of God to change the man or woman of God into the image of God. He uses this book to conform us to be more and more like Jesus. And so we're just praying, Lord, help me see it. I want to see your glory and help me obey i want to be obedient to you i want to be like jesus so again like i know this is like so simple but i but i hope that that you see how the word and prayer go together we need his help but the promise is he is going to help us grow i love this if you're discouraged if you're like man i just don't see that happening philippians chapter one philippians chapter one verse six paul says this i am confident of this i know this that he who began a good work in you, he'll bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. He finishes what he starts. And so if you haven't already, carve out 15, 20 minutes today. And then get up tomorrow and do it again. Spend time reading God's word. But let me try to, let me, let me try to just get really practical. Let's just apply this. Okay, like what, is this, what does this look like? Let me give you some, maybe some um, practical tips for how to develop or to get back into the discipline of reading your Bible. I'm going to give you five things, and this is not exhaustive, okay? Uh, but hopefully these are helpful, just some things that we're trying to apply God's word here. I I'd say this. Number one, find the sweet spot of your day and stick to it. Maybe, maybe it's before you touch your phone in the morning. Isn't that the first thing we, like, we all like, roll over now and we grab that thing? Or maybe it's the first thing that you do on your phone. And I'd encourage, like, mornings, like, finding a sweet time in the morning. I think there's wisdom there. I think uh, uh, we've seen believers over the years who have been faithful to that, and God has used that time to help them start their day in the Word of God. But let's be real. 4.30 in the morning might not be realistic for you to sustain that. 
Or, or like some of you are like, man, I can't get going until after I've had breakfast or coffee. I know the spirit takes the blindfold off, but coffee really helps sometime too, right? So, so that's fine. Or if you tell me that like, nah, like reading at night is just better for me, that, that's, that's great. But just be aware of the temptation to let it slide and, and, and get distracted. So we're going to find the sweet time, but don't just find time, make time. Here's the second thing I say. Start small, but not too small. Start small, okay? Like, if you haven't been reading a lot of God's Word lately, don't expect to be reading entire books of the Bible every day, unless it's like Philemon or Jude. Like, you could probably handle that. But, but what you want to do is try to just, just pace yourself so that you're spending a good amount of time, maybe one, two, three chapters in God's Word, hopefully more than just glancing at the uh, verse of the day on the Bible app or somebody like, sends you something on social media. Like, like we want to get into the Word of God and focus on building a, a habit, a rhythm of being here. The third thing I say is this, prioritize scripture over commentary. Okay, like I use, um, I've used some devotionals. Those can be helpful, those, those Bible reading plans. Uh, but sometimes those things tend to emphasize someone else's thoughts. And then they kind of tag on some verses to go with that. But, but the psalmist says, like, Lord, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Try to prioritize the study of God's word. Find devotionals and things that help you understand that. And then I'd tell you this. Accountability helps. It does. Find a, I call him a, a Bible reading brother or a Bible reading sister. Maybe you find time, maybe you're going to go to the, uh, Duncan this week, right? Or, or maybe it's just a 30-minute phone call on Fridays at 3 o'clock, whatever it's going to be. Like, we're just, hey, I'm just going to call and, and I'm just going to ask, like, what, what's, what's God been teaching you in his word lately? Or I know my mother-in-law does this. She's on the Bible app and reads. You can read those reading plans with friends. Um, but that's actually how my teenage daughter convinced me that she needed a phone. <laughs> She's like, Dad, all my friends at church, they, they want to read the Bible with me. Like, what am I supposed to say to that? Like, she's, she got me. I, honestly, it, it's helpful to just be able to talk about what God is teaching you in his word. But the last thing I'd say is this. Fight the Pharisee and the fool in your heart. Fight the Pharisee and the fool. The Pharisee is our tendency to just make it all about following the rules. Like it just becomes a checklist, something that I have to do, not something that I want to do because I really love him and I want to spend time with the Lord. We, we really want to grow in our, in our desire there. But on the, on the flip side, the fool actually avoids just going through the motions because he's not in motion at all. Just kind of blowing it off and lacks discipline and runs after distractions. And listen, the, the Pharisee and the fool, neither one of them are operating out of their identity in Christ and pursuing him. So we're trying to build the discipline, but what, what we're really wanting is to cultivate a desire to spend more time with the Lord. And, when, and I'm telling you, the more you open up the pages of scripture and he opens up your minds and you see the glory of Christ, you're going to realize how soul satisfyingly good he is. And you're going to want him. So when you open up your Bible this week, let's pray. Open my eyes. I want to see it. Help me see wondrous things out of your law. Give me understanding so that I might keep your law and observe it with my whole heart and you just watch what happens in this church when each of you are daily asking the lord to use his word to do a work in your heart in your life father i'm so grateful for your word what a sweet thing that you have given us this book so that we could know you so that we could see the glory of jesus and be convinced again you are better than anything this world has to offer and so, Lord, I pray that you would encourage my brothers and sisters here this morning, thankful for the opportunity to just show them how good this book is. Lord, would you help them this week to build the discipline, but also to cultivate that desire that they would want to spend time with you. And then, Lord, we just admit it. We'd acknowledge we need you. We need your help. We need your help to understand it, and we need your help to obey it. But God, would you do that work in and through us for your glory? It's in Jesus' name I pray.